Okay, we're gonna get started. I'm, I'm Dan Rundy, I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIF. We're talking about IMF quota reform and American leadership. We're doing so within the context uh, of the uh, vote that's coming up on the Ukraine assistance bill early next week. Um, there have been a series of uh, additional news, uh, news items uh, last night or this morning. Senator Rubio uh, announced that he doesn't have a, a objections to the Senate bill which includes IMF quota reform. So I think that I think is also something that'll come up in this conversation. But without further ado, I'm gonna ask Congressman Bill Frenzel, who's the co-chairman of the Bretton Woods Committee and a former Republican Congressman from Minnesota to make some opening remarks. Congressman, please come on up. Thank you, Dan. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, <coughs> this is a wonderful event, IMF quota reform and American leadership, it is entitled uh, Dan uh, lured me out of semi-retirement <laughs> uh, uh, <coughs> because he's a friend to make a few opening remarks, and I think he assumes that I can get things confused enough so that the panel will be able to straighten them out one by one, and we'll, be, uh, we'll all know what's right by the time we leave. I want to start simply by setting the stage. This is a very timely program. As most of you know, the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee has passed the Ukraine Assistance Bill, including the IMF quota reform. And uh, that bill will be up on the Senate floor for closure on Monday. It is expected to pass. Uh, on the other side, uh, things are much more difficult. Uh, as you know, the House has uh, uh, had trouble with uh, almost everything. It's at war and it is against everything. The default vote for every member is no. Uh, if you don't know or you don't have a horse in the race, vote no. So it's going to be uh, exceedingly difficult uh, in the House. Uh, particularly so because the uh, uh, speaker uh, is not able to find a relationship between the Ukraine assistance bill and the uh, quota reform bill, uh, which uh, I'd like to talk about a little bit later. Uh, the House has passed its uh, Ukraine bill and, uh, and it doesn't seem a bit interested in the quota reform. Uh, Congress is a tough place to operate uh, normally, the difficult stuff uh, starts in the House. However, with uh, international matters, the Senate is uh, usually a bit more reliable. And it seems to me that the Senate has to uh, put a bill into conference and stay with it uh, before we uh, can expect uh, anything from the House. Uh, Republicans uh, still are uh, mad at the administration. Uh, they're mad at everybody, I think, over there. And uh, they will uh, be uh, very, very uh, careful uh, before they cast their votes for it. But remember, the last three important votes to pass the House, which was the budget, the CR, and the debt limit, all were passed with about 40 Republican votes and about 180 Democrat votes. And if a bill uh, comes out of conference, uh, in the Senate form, that's what's going to have to happen. Uh, uh, members of the House have uh, uh, people running against them in primaries from their own right, and it's pretty hard, as they used to say, you have to step off the world to get to the right of many of those members, but they seem to have people running uh, from that position. And uh, so they're very nervous. Uh, but there is, I think, a possibility, and uh, if uh, the House leadership uh, understands the relationship between quota reform and the Ukraine assistance bill, I think there is a chance. Uh, for those of us on the Bretton Woods Committee, we think the uh, reforms are important and need to accompany the bill. Now, the reforms aren't enough. They're a very small beginning. Uh, nevertheless, until we uh, uh, ratify them, uh, we can't uh, do any better than that. 
But what they do do is they're going to give the uh, IMF the ability to lend more uh, to the Ukraine uh, when uh, they are in the final Ukraine uh, assistance uh, package of many countries, which will be required to bring the Ukraine back, we hope. Uh, the President and the Congress uh, uh, want to help uh, the Ukes. The, uh, the assistance bills uh, seem to have no trouble themselves. But we can't do it alone, and nor uh, are a lot of our allies uh, with us going to be able to help us to do it alone. Uh, many of them are as broke as we are. We believe that only the IMF has the, uh, the total resources, the ability to, uh, to restore market confidence, and the capacity to support the reforms uh, in countries like the Ukraine. Uh, we see uh, that uh, there, we don't see any difficulty with the reforms because we believe the United States retains its leadership role. It retains its uh, veto on important matters with its 16.5% uh, uh, voting rights. And uh, uh, there are some that say, well, we're boosting Russia's uh, importance in the IMF. Yes, we are. They go from 2.4% to 2.6%. Uh, uh, God bless them. Uh, if that helps them a lot, I'll be very surprised. Uh, the, uh, the IMF, we also believe, is essential for not only for security, but also, also for stability in the world. It's been a useful tool for our own economic security. You remember when the wall fell down, the uh, IMF was an important factor in putting uh, Eastern Europe back on a reasonable footing. Uh, you probably, some of you remember the Asian contagion that, uh, uh, that the IMF uh, helped uh, straighten out in, in Asia. Uh, American administrations and American Congresses of both parties ha have relied and supported on the IMF since the Bretton Woods Conference just after World War II. Uh, <coughs> it is, the problem with it is that uh, members of Congress don't understand it, uh, don't really care much about it. There's no benefit to them for it. All they have is the knowledge that they've done the right thing for their country. Uh, we hope that that'll be enough for some of them. And uh, so that's my take on the IMF and the uh, and the quota reform and the Ukrainian assistance bill. And now you can hear the real stuff from our panel. Thanks, Thanks very much, Congressman. <laughs> thank you for your public service and also thank you for your leadership of the Bretton Woods Committee. Thanks very much, Congressman. Uh, I'm going to ask my friend Clay Lowry, who used to be Assistant Secretary uh, for International Affairs at the Treasury Department. He's now at the uh, at, uh, uh, and he's, you have his biography in front of him, but as someone who really understands the uh, Bretton Woods institutions, to give us a, a little bit of a, um, an IMF 101 at first, and then to talk a little bit about his perspective on, on the quota reform. Clay, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Dan, and uh, thanks for everybody for coming. Um, I'm just going to take a couple minutes just to make sure to set a little bit of context, um, because I know there's sometimes confusion about the IMF. So what is the IMF? Um, <clears throat> it comes out of after World War II. Uh, there's, you will always hear about the Bretton Woods uh, meetings. And three institutions were created. One was the IMF, one was the World Bank, and one was eventually what became the WTO. Um, the World Bank and the IMF are the ones that uh, sometimes get very confused. So the World Bank is there to help alleviate poverty. It works on developing countries some in emerging markets to provide long-term finance. That's basically what it does. It does a lot of technical assistance, a lot of work in, uh, in many different areas. Obviously, today is not about the World Bank. The IMF, on the other hand, was created <clears throat> a lot because of the beggar thy neighbor policies that came out of the 1930s. Some say one of the factors that led towards World War II. And so the IMF, basically, the essential argument for the IMF over the last 60 or 70 years is to create a better international economic order. And the objectives of the IMF are to do three things. 
One, to help create macroeconomic stability. Two, to help create financial stability. And usually when you think about that, you think of what are called balance of payments issues. And three is to help catalyze the, and using those two things to help catalyze economic growth. <clears throat> they have a variety of different tools. The two most important ones are surveillance, which is basically just a fancy name for, they do an evaluation and assessment of a country's economy, their banking system, and basically try to offer advice to the authorities. They do that from every country, from the United States to, um, to Ghana, to France, to Ukraine, to Russia. Um, and then they do the thing that obviously gets the most attention, which is they lend money and they provide financial support. They, are, they usually do it for liquidity purposes and for what are, again, for balance of payments purposes. Um, in order to do that, they have to be financed. The way that it's financed is through what is called quota. Now, quota is just a fancy name for having equity or capital in, in the IMF. And the equity for uh, the United States and for all the countries is based largely, not totally, largely on the size of your economy in the world system. So the United States is obviously the biggest player. <clears throat> There's a little bit of adjustment that's made in order to make sure that some of the poorer countries that are very, very small economies have a little bit of voting share. They don't have much, but at least something uh, that, so that they are players at the IMF as well. Unlike the United Nations, it is not one country, one vote. It is how much equity do you have? So the United States has an equity, and the congressman referred to this, um, for Russia, but it's also for the United States is roughly about voting share of 16.7, 16.8%, I never can remember exactly what. Um, and of that, there's a veto right at 15 percentage points over major, major decisions that are made at the IMF. Not the day-to-day -day decisions or not the lending decisions, but kind of major structural decisions of which quota reform is one of them. Um, so then that brings us to what is it that we are talking about today. <clears throat> so over the last, I would say, 10 years probably, there's been a major effort within the IMF to try to reform that system of quotas because it reflects really kind of the 1950s and 1960s economy as opposed to the 2000, now 2010 economies. Um, and so you've seen different voting shares change over the time. Um, through a series of reforms, of which the biggest probably one is the 2010 reform. The 2010 reform was an agreement that was made to do basically three things, or do a few things, I don't want to say three, is one, is to change the voting structure even more so we know which countries have which votes. So countries that went up in voting share include Russia, as the congressman said, they go from less than three percentage points of voting share to less than three percentage points of voting share. Um, China actually has a significant increase, not surprisingly given the size of the Chinese economy. Um, there are a lot of economies that are considered, that I think we would like to hear a lot more of a voice from in, in the world. Mexico goes up, Australia goes up, Korea goes up, Singapore goes up. Some countries that go down um, include many European countries, um, and then that gets you into a second issue, which is that's about voting shares. Then you have a different issue, which is what are they called the chairs issue. What chairs are occupied by which votes? In the past, the United States occupies one chair. There's nobody else within that chair. It's just the United States. The Europeans occupy either eight or nine chairs, depending on how you count it, and so, and obviously the Europeans can come together, and so sometimes that creates issues for the United States. Uh, we are very friendly with the uh, Europeans, but we don't agree with everything, and sometimes that does create some issues. So the idea was to basically reduce the number of chairs that the Europeans would have from that eight or nine to basically six or seven. Um, <clears throat> and the reason why I say six or seven is because there's rotations that go on. Um, the third thing it did was to basically uh, do a shift in resources. So the IMF, again, finances itself through its quota resources, and that allows countries to borrow based on their size of quota. And um, in 2009, 
um, in the middle of the financial crisis, there was a, in, a significant increase in the IMF resources to help deal with the problems that were currently going on. Those resources went into a variety of different instruments. Some went into quota, some went into bilateral programs, some went into something called the New Arrangements to Borrow, the NAB. That's how the United States did it. So the United States basically put in $110 billion. Um, it had a budgetary score at the time of roughly $5 billion. The package that is before the, uh, the United States today was agreed upon in 2010. In order for the United States to pass it, it must get authority from Congress and it must get appropriations. The appropriations part is going to be to take, it's to take $60 million of that 110 I told you about and move it from the NAB over to quota. So it's basically just a transfer within the one bu back bucket of the United, uh, IMF to another bucket in the IMF. There's a cost to that, largely because in 20, 2009, it was done under an emergency appropriations. And in this case, it would not be under an emergency appropriations. They have different rules within Congress. It costs money to do that. The money that it cost is rough, it's been estimated to be 315 million, I think I got that right. Mm -hmm. uh, 315 million uh, is the budgetary score. So for $315 million, the United States will move uh, money from one pot to another, and but by doing that, it's going to free up a lot more resources, as the congressman said, so countries like Ukraine can actually borrow more if they are into a balanced payments crisis. Okay, that's kind of where we are right now. <clears throat> now, let me give you my opinions. <laughs> um, so, um, the um, why is it that we even care about the IMF, or are we in the, we're in the IMF? Usually, if I was talking about this, I would be talking about the economics and financial issues. I worked at the Treasury Department for 16 years. Those are the types of things I usually worked on. Today, I wanted to talk about something slightly different, which is we do this because it is in our national interest. And it's in our national interest for three reasons. One, foreign policy tool that we sometimes need. Two, the leadership of the United States. And three, leverage. Let me start with leverage. Um, the United States puts a dollar into the IMF. For every dollar that the United States puts in, five dollars comes out. Mm -hmm. um, so that means that we are getting a fairly significant leverage effect by basically putting our money in there, um, which means that in the end, actually, it costs us less to have money in the IMF than it would otherwise. Because I promise you, if Ukraine or other countries get run into financial difficulties and the IMF doesn't exist, the, the country that will be bearing the burden for that most of the time will be the United States. And it'll be a much heavier burden than a one to five ratio than, uh, than it is allowed by the IMF. So that's my first point. My second point is about a tool of foreign policy. The IMF is there to do economic and financial resources. It's staffed by a bunch of PhDs. They do honest, good work. Uh, they make mistakes, like everybody. Um, it is an institution that is evolved. It will continue to evolve, as my old boss, Hank Paulson, used to say, institutions that don't evolve die. Um, and this one is continuing to evolve, which includes moving your voting share around. But it also actually acts as a tool sometimes when the United States has a foreign policy problem. So let's go back in time. In the 1980s, when Ronald Reagan was the President of the United States, they supported a quota increase. That's a fairly conservative Republican President. <clears throat> Part of that is because of the, um, the needs that the IMF was under at the time, and part of it was because of what happens in, there was a crisis going on in the 80s, and was the Latin American crisis. It basically, a bunch of countries that are on, uh, that are next to the United States were in deep trouble, they were not growing, they, and so what did the United States do? We came up with what was called the Baker Plan and then the Brady Plan, and those are very complicated plans, but in the end, they were backed by financing from the IMF as well as from conditionality by the IMF. Again, something that actually was helpful to the United States because we could not do it alone. In the 1990s, the 
country of Korea, a country in which we have over 30,000 troops in, basically suffered a huge financial crisis in, the 19, in 1997. It was the IMF that went in there. The IMF basically in Korea is probably persona non grata, but it was the IMF that put up the financial support at the time that allowed the Korean economy to survive that situation and to continue to thrive as it does today. And it is a country that is obviously a huge ally of the United States. After 9-11 in, uh, uh, in, in, in 2001, 2002, the, there was a number of problems going on that we were trying to address, as you can imagine, including the fact that some of the work that we were doing in Afghanistan to go after Osama bin Laden was creating huge problems in Pakistan. It was creating deep, deep financial problems. Um, it was the IMF that stood up and basically went into Pakistan and created a balance of payment support package that actually helped them come through that time. Now, that doesn't mean the Pakistanis did everything right with that. They certainly did not. But it was the IMF that actually created that issue. In 2008, the country of Georgia was invaded by Russia. Um, in that, during that time, um, I remember talking to the finance minister of the country of Georgia for probably about two hours. He was very scared of the banking system. We're going to lose total confidence in the banking system. We, don't, we won't have liquidity. He wanted to see whether or not the United States could be supportive and provide financing. I will tell you, this happened almost exactly the same time that Lehman Brothers was collapsing. And, the, um, and by the way, lots of countries in Eastern Europe were collapsing as well. I actually talked to him about, can you go to the IMF and get a package, which they did. The IMF stood up, went into Georgia, again, helped support the financial system in a very, very important foreign policy issue for us. Today, we obviously face another one, and that's Ukraine. My third point is about leadership. So I am uh, I'm associated with the Republican Party. Um, <clears throat> the Republican Party's major criticism, I think, of President Obama has been about lack of leadership on, in, on, the foreign, on foreign policy issues. Some people will disagree with that. Uh, some people can agree with it, whatever you want. But leadership entails, what is the definition of leadership? I don't actually have a great one, but I can tell you what it probably means is that you, if you identify a problem that you need to figure out how to solve, you come up with a plan and a strategy and then you try to uh, husband resources to try to go and lead towards solving that problem. One of the identified problems in Ukraine is basically that there is a big, big financial hole. One billion dollar guarantee by the U.S. government, which is a good, pa a good package, it will do nothing. It'll do nothing. It'll just be money down a rat hole because the problem is, is the, pa the hole is too big. And so that means you're going to have to come up with an IMF package. You can have the Europeans, you can have the U.S., you're going to have others, you're going to have to need, you're going to need the IMF. Um, could the IMF do that package if the quota reform bill is not passed? Yes, they can. Um, but how, how difficult is it going to be for us, for us to basically work on getting the IMF to actually lead, help lead a, uh, the process of creating financial stability when the United States is the only country, major country in the world, who has not supported a reform package to actually, that has been going on for almost four years? I would say that that is probably not the definition of leadership. I was glad what Dan said about, at the start about Marco Rubio. He's a senator I respect for the following reasons. He doesn't know who the heck I am. Um, but I respect him because he's coming up with solutions. He identifies problems and comes up with solutions. He doesn't just provide rhetoric. He was worried, clearly, about the U.S. role in the world. He gave a speech in U the United Kingdom back in December, and he said, skepticism has come in the form Skepticism about the United States has come in the form of growing doubt about whether America can still be counted on to contribute to our mutual security and to uphold an international order that reflects our interests and ideals. I would argue that Marco Rubio is correct, and the fact that we're not supporting the IMF contributes to that same problem that he is worried about. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask uh, Scott Morris, who used to be a Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for uh, working on development, de development and debt issues. You're now at the Center for Global Development, and you write very uh, persuasively and 
cogently about the multilateral system of which the United States is a part. Scott, the floor is yours. Thanks, Dan. It is um, a pleasure to be here. I, I think I will end up talking mostly about Ukraine. It is hard not to these days. Um, but I do want to start with a, a broader point that is not actually captured in, in the Ukraine discussion. I think you will hear a lot of um, the points that Clay has already made very well, but frankly, I have written my stuff down and I am not going to abandon it at this point. So, <laughs> um, so the broader point, um, and this is not controversial, and you know, even if you are uh, my mother in central Pennsylvania, this, this does not come as news to you. Financial crises happen in the world. Um, on, uh, very rarely uh, they, they happen domestically here in the U.S., and mostly they happen in other countries. Um, you know, the, lar the U.S. Is, is a large economy and an open economy, so in many ways it is uniquely vulnerable to the effects of crises, particularly w when they happen in large economies in other countries. Um, and, you know, that vulnerability, uh, you can measure it in lost exports um, the, that uh, the U.S. sees when one of its major trading partners faces a crisis, a crisis of some sort. Um, lost exports means lost jobs. Um, you see it, the impact on, on our equity markets. So there, there are real negative effects, I think we can all agree, um, by virtue of us um, participating openly in the global economy. Um, so what do we do about that? You know, this is not something, uh, you know, in a simplistic way, the U.S. cannot build fences around our borders to guard against these things. You know, I was thinking about metaphors of um, the contagion of, of, you know, certain diseases and viruses, but, you know, frankly, we don't need a metaphor. We, we've seen this <laughs> uh, in spades in, in recent years in terms of the impact of financial crises. Um, so, so what does the U.S. do? I, as I see it, there, there are three options if you're starting from scratch. Um, one is that we can expect countries um, to, handle, to handle their own problems on their own, that they will pursue um, strong prudential regulatory regimes, that they will have strong reserves, and basically they can work, work things out for themselves. Well, we know that's not um, reality. Um, we can bear a lot of a lot of the burden ourselves, recognizing that there are, there are negative effects that, that re rebound to us, and we have to do something about it. And in fact, you know, we, we do a fair amount of that. Obviously, um, we play a unique role in the global economy, and I think we bear some of that burden. Um, but uh, frankly, to, to literally do that on our own w would be far too costly of a burden to bear. So that takes us to our third option: is we, we need an international mechanism uh, that, through collective action and collective resources, uh, can provide, um, to put it this way, for the U.S. very cheap insurance against these problems um, in the global economy. And of course, that's that's exactly what we have with the IMF in in. Uh, uh, it, through demonstrated experience over over many decades, um, but l let me let me shift from that broader point um, to Ukraine because I think there's um, there's a lot that the, the in my mind is really extraordinary comp extraordinarily compelling about uh, the Ukraine situation in um, identifying a particular role the IMF plays for the United States and that is of, as a strategic partner. Um, and I think it's worth focusing on this because it's not anything you're going to read about on the IMF's website, uh, frankly. Uh, but it's it's um, very meaningful from a U.S. perspective. Um, so, if you look, uh, and I went back and looked uh, on the website of the IMF, you will see on February 27th a statement from from uh, the managing director uh, in response to events in Ukraine, and essentially. Um, signaling a commitment uh, on the funds part to work with the interim government. That is the very day that the interim government took office. Um, did the IMF have to put that statement out on that day? No. Um, I think they did it for a particular effect. Um, and if you are the United States, that is a very helpful effect, is that it is um, it's a particular important institution in the, in the international community moving very quickly to signal its support uh, for an interim government that the United States very much wants to succeed. Um, so the timeliness of that resp response um, really demonstrates um, a, uh, the particular value of, of the, the fund as a strategic partner. Um, as a strategic partner, they can do things uh, on the financing front, as, as Clay described this mechanism, um, that the U.S. cannot do on its own. 
Um, so in our desire to help this fledgling interim government, um, what can we do to mobilize uh, financing? So we have a billion dollar loan guarantee. Um, you know, one, one of the benefits of uh, the Senate already moving on a legislative package that includes both this loan guarantee and the IMF quota reform is that you can actually look at these numbers together and draw some conclusions. And, for, and it's very striking. So in the budget scoring of this, again, as Clay described, um, the quota reform package is scored at $315 million. I think a lot of us uh, would dispute the need for even that scoring. I think there's a longer history in which um, the, the view was that it, you really didn't have to appropriate any, any funds for IMF commitments, but um, that's essentially a settled issue, and we have the score of $315 million, so let's accept that. The billion-dollar loan guarantee that is a bilateral um, loan guarantee from the United States is scored at $350 million. So let's extrapolate. Uh, you know, the Ukraine government is asking for $15 billion at this point from the IMF. So suppose we don't have the fund playing that role and the U.S. is playing that role and extrapolate those, those, those scores from CBO. Um, you're talking about a $5 billion budget um, appropriations hit to the U.S. if it wanted to extend $15 billion in loan guarantees to Ukraine. Um, that's a tremendously expensive uh, proposition, and, 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 and frankly, it's meant to reflect the underlying risk of the U.S. on a bilateral basis extending this kind of assistance. Um, and in contrast, um, how much that risk is diminished when we work through this multilateral mechanism to extend, extend that scale of assistance. Um, so, you know, to me, that's, that really is very striking. And then finally, um, as a strategic partner in steering the policy dialogue with Ukraine and making sure that um, they are pursuing a reform agenda um, that, that strength, strengthens the very principles and values um, that we hold in the U.S. and hold for other countries, and, and frankly, in contrast, um, to other regional interests um, and certainly the role of Russia so that the we can look to the fund as an effective partner in pursuing an economic reform agenda um, with this new government. Um, a few words on uh, the legislative process as it pertains to Ukraine and, and um, is, you know, whether the quota reform package should be in a Ukraine bill or should not. Um, so. Uh, I worked as a committee staffer on the Hill for 10 years, and um, as a result, um, you know, I'm not going to pretend to be shocked on, on two fronts that, that I do hear shock and, and disappointment. One, the notion that um, the administration would seek to use um, a very necessary Ukraine bill in this fashion. How, how dare they uh, try to hold up um, what would otherwise be a bill that moves very quickly, and, and we've lost a few weeks on this. Well. Look, um, you know, th this is a little bit of political theater. Of, of course, this is exactly what you do um, in, in trying to remove a priority issue. You look for legislative vehicles. Uh, this one has the virtue of actually making um, substantive sense. Um, and, and I think, you know, we've already heard the argument. So um, I think um, I, I, I would want to put that, that aside. On the other hand, um, I'm also not shocked uh, that, that the Republicans uh, would seek to do some horse trading around this issue. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know th th this is what we do. It's part of the legislative process. Um, you know, the challenge here, you know, I, I care a lot about the IMF quota package uh, being approved, so I, I wish they wouldn't, um, that they would simply move it on its merits, but I accept that they, they do want, want to engage in, in some negotiations. Uh, the challenge in this particular horse trading is um, it's not necessarily a horse for a horse or a horse for ten horses. It's, it's not even a horse for another mammal. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we, we have uh, very unrelated issues that seem to be in play. And, and frankly, there's a very practical challenge. And how, how do you, if you're on the administration side, how do you weigh the relative merits of, of, um, of very different things? And you have different uh, constituencies and, and advocates uh, within and without the, the administration on these issues. So that makes it a challenge. Um, you know, I, I can only hope um, that, and, and part of uh, those of us who are outside advocates for the IMF package, is that we, we strengthen the hand in making the case for why quota reform is so compelling and so necessary, and then leave it for uh, 
those who work on the other issues to figure out a, a path forward. Um, finally, I, I, I do want to say a word about uh, the, the quota reform package itself, so getting beyond why the IMF matter is. And, and Clay, again, laid this out in, in terms of what the details of the package is. But it, it is worth, uh, because I, I certainly haven't heard it enough, um, noting what an extraordinary um, outcome the U.S. got in this, this process. Um, it speaks to the way the U.S. can lead in the fund. This was, a very, this was a very strong bit of negotiating on the U.S. part. So let's look at um, what they achieved. So they, they helped steer a path that met the overriding test within the fund of ensuring international legitimacy going forward. So you, you very much needed this realignment of, of voice and vote to reflect where economies are today. Um, and the U.S. helped meet that test for the fund. Uh, in doing so, the U.S. protected its own standing in the fund. So there's no ambiguity with passage of quota reform that, that the U.S. hand is as strong as it's ever been. Um, and, you know, the, in, in, in a measured way, uh, in a way you can measure, uh, you can see it in, in protection of the U.S. veto. And they did so by committing no U new U.S. money, uh, so the transfer of, of resources from the NAB uh, uh, to quotas. Um, that's an extraordinarily good outcome uh, for the U.S. So it's all the more frustrating that having led in that process and achieved that outcome, it is now stalled um, by the U.S. Um, I will, will hope that it, at the end of this process, I think um, uh, parties on the Hill will see it for the slam dunk that it really has been. Um, and, you know, we, we can, uh, a year from now, um, get over the fact that it's taken three and a half, four years to get it done um, and, and be satisfied with the ultimate outcome. Thanks. Ask uh, Desmond Lockman, who's a resident fellow at AEI, and he had a, a past life as a managing director and chief emerging market economist strategist at Salmon Smith Barney from 96 to 2003. He was also at the IMF for a period of time. I'm going to ask him to, um, to present his perspective on, on this uh, conversation. Uh, Desmond. Thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, perhaps at the outset, I'll say that while I am a U.S. citizen right now, I wasn't brought up in the U.S. culture, so I'm not totally familiar with base b basketball. But I don't think that this is a total slam dunk. And that is really uh, where I'm going to be taking my, my comments. What I want to do is basically make three points. The first is that Ukraine, this whole deal of providing Ukraine with aid, has got very little to do with IMF reform. You know, this is purely a political move, which I think is of a cynical nature. The second point I want to make is that it's far from clear that the IMF needs the amount of resources that this proposal would make on a permanent basis to the IMF. And the third point I want to make is that an oversized IMF is not necessarily in the system's interest. So let me start with the first point on uh, Ukraine and reform. What we're talking about in Ukraine is Ukraine possibly might be needing from the IMF something like 15, 20 billion dollars. You know, you could perhaps a little bit more, a little bit less. But there's no question that the IMF has got more than enough money to make that loan. Now, the notion that the IMF, uh, that the United States uh, is holding up this reform, the IMF has been holding up this reform for the last three and a half years, but that didn't stop the IMF from making massive loans to Greece, to Portugal, to Ireland, to Cyprus, et cetera. So I don't see why uh, it's very different in uh, the Ukraine uh, case. Uh, the IMF reform, what it would do is it would increase the quotas of countries like China, Russia, Brazil, India. But if we look down the list, what it would also do is it would reduce the relative size of a country like Ukraine. You know, Ukraine goes from something like 0.63% to something like 0.48%. So it doesn't increase the amount of money that the IMF can lend to Ukraine. 
Now, one of the observations that a casual observer of the IMF would notice over the last 10, 15 years is that the amount of money that the IMF lends to a country has got absolutely nothing to do with the size of that country's quota. That what you do is you determine the amount of money that the IMF needs to lend to the country, and then you just figure out what the country's quota is and then come up with the number as to what percentage of the quota you're going to lend to the country. So originally, in the 1970s, 1980s, the IMF had a strict limit. You could only lend a country something like 300% of quota. Then they talked about exceptional access, and then suddenly in the case of Mexico in the 1994 crisis, it went up, and then in the 1998 crisis, we were at 1,000%, and then came along Greece, we lent 2,000% uh, to Greece. So what I'm saying is quota reform. Firstly, the quota of, uh, the relative size of the quota of Ukraine goes down, but it makes no difference, because if you wanted to lend $15 billion, what it would amount to is only something like 800% of Ukraine's quota. If you could lend 2,000% of Greece's quota, I'm not sure why you can't lend 800% of quota. It's a situation where, to me, it doesn't look like their rules. Uh, having grown up in South Africa, we used to have a statement about Britannia. We used to say that Britannia didn't rule the waves, but rather what Britannia did was wave the rules, and that is what the IMF uh, seems to do on a regular basis. So let me come to uh, the, uh, uh, so in short, I would just say that uh, uh, this is rather a cynical move by the administration to link this uh, IMF reform to aid to Ukraine, and I find it particularly disconcerting about the state of United States politics when it was only a month or two ago that the president was railing against how outrageous it was that the Republicans were wanting to link increasing uh, the size of the debt ceiling to public spending. I, I think that the two issues are analogous, that they've got nothing to do with one another, uh, but you're using this as a lever. Uh, a more important point is about the size of the resources. While I certainly support the idea that the Brazils and the Russias and the Indias, the fast-growing parts of the global economy that have increased the size, should have greater relative representation at the board that we totally need governance reform, I would distinguish that from do we really need a large IMF? So if I could just go through a little bit of uh, history. Uh, in 2008, around about 2008, policymakers were seriously talking about what is the relevance of the IMF, shouldn't the IMF be downsized, they were reducing the staff of the IMF, for after all, with the IMF's way in which it handled the Asian crisis, the Asian, cri the Asian countries, swore that they would never put themselves in a position that they'd have to go and be supplicants to the IMF. Same true of Latin American countries, Argentina, Brazil, these countries foreswore that they would never want to borrow from the IMF. They introduced reforms, built up reserves, moved flexible currencies, uh, same story with Russia. So the IMF didn't exactly have many clients. What put the IMF back into business was the European crisis. And the reason that this whole G20 decision to increase the size of the IMF by the amount that they did was to deal with the countries in the European periphery, the Greece's, Ireland's, Portugal's, potentially Spain's and Italy's. And they did it because the Europeans were not in a position to do it themselves. That was then, that was in 2010. Uh, Keynes famously said uh, to somebody, he said, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? Evidently, the US administration uh, doesn't change its mind when the facts change. So some of the facts that have changed are that the European stability mechanism has now been created as a permanent mechanism that the Europeans have set up with an amount of no less than Euro 500 billion. You know, this is, we're talking about real money that they've now got to deal with the problems in Europe. And more importantly, is the ECB 
in September, the European Central Bank in September 2012 set up something called the OMT, the Outright Monetary Transaction Program, which basically meant that the European Central Bank would do what it ev whatever it took to make sure that there wasn't a problem in a member country, provided the member country played by the rules, meaning that the ECB could use its printing press to buy all of the bonds of Italy and Spain uh, that were needed. So in short, what has occurred is the very justification for enlarging the size of the IMF has now disappeared. So what I'm at a loss is what does the IMF need 400, 500 billion uh, euro dollars uh, in lending capability? You know, to whom exactly is it going to lend? It can do many, many uh, uh, Ukraines of that size. So you know, I think that the notion of just going along with a very enlarged IMF, uh, I think that one should really throw that into question. The final point I want to make is that too big an IMF uh, is not without its consequences. You know, my view of the world is that if you have the IMF departing from its original objective of being a catalytic lender, providing conditionality, providing a macro framework, figuring out how to do it, but instead throwing huge amounts of money at each occasion, allowing that money to be used to bail out the bondholders so the guys who made the bad investments get made whole effectively. You know, that's really what we've just seen has occurred in places like Greece right now to a large extent. Uh, that just encourages uh, moral hazard. So, you know, for instance, like in the Ukraine case right now, uh, it's of concern to me that uh, a fund, you know, it's well known in the markets, Frankel Templeton, that these guys have loaded up on Ukraine bonds, much the way in which they did because they were high yielding. To have them bailed out without their making some kind of contribution uh, just seems to make uh, nonsense of the scheme. So I'm not in favor of having a very large IMF that's got huge amount of resources that can use, they'll just do, fall into the temptation that they've done in the past, that they've done in the uh, case of uh, uh, Greece, Ireland, and Portugal. And I just mention in closing uh, that it is of note that the IMF itself uh, is recognizing that the massive lending program that they did to Greece was a huge mistake, that it should have first been preceded by debt restructuring, you wouldn't have needed quite the amount of money that it, the IMF threw at Greece. Greece would have had a very better chance of getting out there. So in short, I don't think that this is a total slam dunk, uh, that we should be just going along with a really very large IMF where the United States uh, loses a certain amount of control because the point that this is only going to cost $365 billion million in uh, appropriation is only part of the story. What is, I think, the bigger part of the story is that when the money sits as it does right now in the, the uh, new, new arrangement to borrow, uh, the United States has an effective veto over that money. Once that money goes into uh, the general bin of money in the quotas, the IMF loses uh, that veto, and it means that the United States doesn't have quite the same say as it does before in determining the size of a bailout package, how that will be uh, structured, and I think that that can cost uh, the U.S. taxpayer uh, money, you know, which uh, um, you know, I would be concerned about. Thank you, Desmond. I'm going to ask Joe Marie Grace Braver to uh, be our last commentator, and then we'll, I'll have a couple of questions. She's the Executive Director for New Rules for Global Finance. Joe Marie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, it's my privilege to hold up the left end of the spectrum here, and uh, for many of my friends and myself as well, I'm a little bit surprised to be speaking both in support of the IMF um, at CSIS. So. Uh, this is, you will see what a good Jesuit education can do for you when, I, when you hear me speak. I can, I can spin an argument anyway, but seriously, <laughs> I, I am extremely uh, committed to the reform proposals, and the reason being, I mean, their rationales, their ex 
explanations that have been presented already, that it's a leadership tool for the United States, it's, a, it's um, how can we ha play an active role leading in the current IMF if we sit back on the reforms that the United States actually was very active in pushing for and working with the emerging market economies. Uh, my goal is what we can do after these reforms are over, but that's, you don't have to worry about what I'm gonna do later, okay? This is, we're on the, the focus is on the present. And I do wanna say that this whole reform initiative was really grew out of the G20 that George Bush, again, I am complimenting George W. Bush, so you put that in your record book. I am very um, pleased and proud of what he managed to do to pull the G20 together in the fall of 2008. And out of that grew the increased size of the IMF immediately, which was passed in the Congress in 2009. And if anyone here is upset about how the administration passed that package, um, I lead that pack of people in the opposition. So uh, you are not alone in that. But we are in real politique. This is how American politics gets done. It's not um, an aesthetic process to be watched close at hand, right? Sausage making, right. Um, so what I do want to say is um, I think three questions have been addressed. And one is why do we approve the IMF reform in itself? I want to focus on one of the reforms that have been mentioned. Uh, why support re Ukraine? You all know why. That's a no-brainer in the American context, so I'm not even gonna refer to that because there are so many reasons to support Ukraine in and of itself, but why link the two uh, in addition to the marriage of convenience? Um, there are, in terms of IMF reforms, there are a couple of things that, um, I think Clay did a, a brilliant summary of the, the content of that package. It's pretty complicated and you can get lost. But one of the things is that it requires the Europeans to give up two chairs. This was a bloody fight. And um, you, they did agree to it reluctantly and over an extended period of time. And why does that matter in this context? I have heard concerns raised about the package provided by the IMF to the Europeans and concerns that there may be default on that debt and it could harm the, uh, the ranking, if you will, of IMF loans. Uh, part of the reason why it was so easy for the IMF to lend to Europe was this overrepresentation of Europe. Eight to 10 out of 24 seats are permanently controlled by the Europeans. They are re required, the advanced Europeans are required by this to give, give up two chairs, and if the US continues on its 2010 trajectory, it would be reduced to more. That means within the IMF, you know, the politics within the IMF, yes, the U.S. has a veto. Yes, we have a loud voice, but we have one chair, one executive director at the table. There are eight, even 10, when the European Commission sits there. So the leadership, the leading of the IMF is much more the Europeans. And some of my best friends are Europeans. It's not that I dislike Europeans. But the weight of the Europeans is overextended. It's overstated. The US will retain its veto. There will be some reduction in the, the representation of the Europeans. And what the miracle of this uh, reforms cluster was that the emerging market economies all gained, and they gained appropriately. And in human history, it is rare for emergent countries to be welcomed to the leadership table. And they, it's, there's no war to keep them out, and there's no war to get in. So this was the genius of the G20 and President Bush. So hats off to him and to those who worked with him. This is, and for this reason, we do want to support these reforms. Again, to have the United States pushing so hard and then not able to back up what it says. This has echoes across all of US foreign policy in every forum, not just in the IMF. 
So the other um, element of the, um, a few other points that I wanted to raise uh, relate to what Desmond just said, and much of what he said I agree with completely, but on the um, veto over the NAB, for example, every country that contributes to the new arrangement to borrow has veto over the use of their funds. Now, they, want, they operate by a consensus within, within the new arrangement to borrow, but so far no country has vetoed and every country has agreed to go along. And the ones who put in, who led in the contributions to the new arrangement to borrow, and in a subsequent contribution, uh, contributions to the IMF, were exactly China, Russia, Brazil. These were the leading contributors. So they do want, finally, to get the quota share that they were promised four years ago, and it can't happen without the quota reform, I mean, with this whole package of reforms. Another element that is uh, in the, the quota package is the doubling of quotas. And that, in that sense, yes, Ukraine goes down slightly in the percentage, but it doubles in the amount it can get immediately. It goes from about half a billion to a billion immediately. So in addition to the immediate loan guarantee from the United States, and somebody has to provide the original loan and we just provide the guarantee, and the Financial Times isn't sure about who's gonna come up with that initial loan, but they get immediate, they have the option of an immediate billion dollars from the IMF, and that's true. It's not gonna make a whole lot of difference, one billion, two billion, when you're talking 15. Now, the other thing about the money uh, for Ukraine is that when the money goes, the Ukraine, under the discipline of the IMF, will be required to deal with its debts. And yes, some of those debts do belong to, this, to Russia. Oops, I almost said Soviet Union. Maybe greater Russia. Anyway, yes, there will be a repayment of some debts to Russia, but what it does is it really is the price of bringing Ukraine back into the West. If Ukraine is entirely dependent on Russia for its oil, for its financing, they have to pay political attention to Russia. That's where their meal ticket is. If the lending is provided by a consensus of global uh, governments, including Russia, which has this tiny percentage, then Ukraine is freer to follow its own political destiny, which, as we see, seems to be with the West. It seems to be with the West. So the IMF does provide discipline. Many of my colleagues on the left say it's conditionality and it's horrible. Well, yeah, it is hard to tighten your, your belt. It's very hard. But IMF provides the discipline that goes along with the money and to set the house in order, including the reduction of, of subsidies on petroleum products, which is the price of petroleum is, I believe, 80% subsidized by the government of Ukraine. That's unsustainable. And with the IMF, that can be brought down to a more realistic level. Now, uh, there are things that we can go round and round about different uh, interpretations of reality. I think. Um, and perceptions are very important. Let me just say that on the overall size of the IMF, it is well below the proportion of trade that it was in the 1940s. It was something like five to seven percent, and it is well below that now. So in terms of the size of the IMF, but that's, that's not the agenda for today. Um, I do want to thank you for being here, for being patient listeners, and now's your chance to talk. Thanks, Joe Marie. Let me just summarize a couple things I've heard, and I want to put a couple questions to the panel, and then I am going to open it up for Q&A for this group. Um, I think I've heard a couple things. That One is that um, there's a consensus that the makeup of the chairs or the controlling shares of the IMF should more appropriately reflect the size of economies. I think I heard a consensus across these um, these panelists to say that that 
the, ge the general principle of reflecting a, an economy that uh, economies that were a snapshot from the 1950s isn't appropriate for a, a set of governance days. So things like having 10 chairs for the Europeans, I think most people, in, at least in, on this side of the Atlantic and many parts of the rest of the world would say that's, that's, that's a little bit of an antiquated notion. Um, having sizes and quotas reflecting the size of economies would be appropriate, such as China. So in essence, this shift in shares in a simple way is to take some, some shareholdings from Europe and a teeny amount from the United States and to distribute it among some of the um, e emerging economies. So the United States, I think, goes, I think it was, I, I think it's actually 17.7 percent to 17.4, something like that. Right, that's right. Okay, thank you. So I think th this is highly complex, uh, highly, um, in, and there's a whole industry of folks that you know live live off of this stuff. But I think the reason it's it's gotten into sort of the broader bloodstream is because it's up for a vote uh, around the conversation around Ukraine because it's so highly esoteric, and because it's something most people don't understand what the heck the IMF does. And so I think. Understanding that there's a, the, the, the additional thing I, I want to just clarify is if I understand it correctly, and I want the panelists to, to correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that one share, that 15 percent of the shares have an out, have some form of a veto over, of decisions of various kinds. And at, at, when the smoke clears on this reform, the United States, either in terms of its shares or in terms of its quota, whatever you want to, measure it is still going to have enough to have out, outright veto on all of the on, on a sort of big decisions of the IMF. So so I think this is important that the when some concerns have been raised about that the United States will somehow lose control of the IMF. My belief is that if you're at either depending on whether we're talking about shares or quota, if it's north of 15 percent, you still got a veto. And so I think that's the basic gist of the, of the point you need to, my view is what you need to understand in terms of that the U.S. will still have overall control of this. So that's, that's one point I want to get across to, to this group. I think the other thing that hasn't come up in this conversation is in the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a series of, let's call them uh, alternatives to the IMF that the United States is not a shareholder in or does not have some form of leadership in or, frankly, control over. And let me just give you a couple examples. So there was the Cyprus banking crisis a couple of years ago. Well, the Cypriots went to Russia first and said, hey, can we get a bailout of a banking system? And we might also consider throwing in a naval base in the Mediterranean. And if I think that th this, for this audience, I think that should get people's attention. So that actually did come up. It didn't actually happen, but it was discussed. Uh, in the case of Egypt, um, Egypt's, uh, the new authoritarian government, uh, the al-Sisi government, uh, has, instead of going to the World Bank, or the IMF has gone to Saudi Arabia and to some Gulf states and has gotten something between 10 or 15 billion dollars. There have been a series of Asian countries that have been trying to work out bilateral agreements with China in terms of, so these are sort of, let's call these alternatives to the IMF. They don't have the surveillance mechanism, they don't have um, sort of all the smart PhD guys that fly in or gals that fly in and provide expertise or laying on of hands and saying their books are okay. So in some ways, the, these are opt-outs of the international system. And some of them I don't think are in the American interest. If, you, if, they said, if, if they had cut a deal, Cyprus had cut a deal and set up a naval base for the Russians, I'm not sure that this audience here would think that's a good outcome. I, I don't, certainly don't think that's a good outcome. So. I, I just want to, so I want you, to, the, the panelists, to comment on this issue of shares and control. And I'd like each of you to just comment briefly on, let's call these opt-outs of the current IMF system, if I can put it that way. But I, and I'm going to start first with Scott, and we're just going to go down this way. So I'm going to start with you, Scott, first. Um, okay. Yeah. No, I think you've characterized the issue of, um, it's the issue of supermajorities. What, what, what decisions in the fund, um, require an 85% 80, majority and, and which don't. And uh, the U.S. alone um, on those 85% decisions have the has the ability to block. Um, I think um, it's, a, it's important to emphasize on the NAB versus quota that the decision making is actually very comparable. You have super, super majority requirements on activation of the NAB and any changes in quota 
but at the executive board level on decisions about distribution of NAB or quota related um, operations, it's a simple majority. And that doesn't change. So again, I so just be clear, the NAB is like an emergency fund that was set up to deal with crises as opposed to sort of the normal operations of the IMF, right? Yeah, and it, but it, you know, to emphasize, I, the the U.S. is not by by transferring the funds over is not ceding any any degree of control over those funds. Um, in in terms of um, you know the opt outs, yeah, I think you're you're raising a legitimate question here, and um, you know there are also questions about what are the economic costs globally to countries choosing to self insure uh, versus using more of an insurance kind of mechanism like the fund. But, but certainly from the U.S. perspective, just the you know, very simple lack of transparency around um, these kinds of relationships makes it very hard um, um, uh, to, to form judgments about uh, what's going on, whether economically or geostrategically. So, Scott, we're not going to lose control of the IMF with this quota reform. That's, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, no, I, look, I think, again, I... The, the U.S. got a very good deal under quota reform, and uh, and in 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 that by that very measure, not ceding a, any any real authority. Let me before I, let me before I ask Joe Marie to answer this. Let me just push him one other thing because I think this is actually something that's quite um, timely. Uh, it's possible that this is going to get passed in the Senate next week because I think Senator Ruby has come forward and say this is the situation in Ukraine is so important that we need to show a united front in the U.S. Senate about how serious what's happened in Ukraine and that he is dropping his objection to IMF quota reform. This is in the last 12 hours in the Washington Post. Um, in the House, there are some additional objections from, from the ones you've heard, and some of them, I think, are reflected in Desmond's comments, which are, this is 300 and X million dollars, some of which is going to come out of the Armed Services Committee. Buck McKeon, who is the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, said, hey, why is this coming out of our boys in uniform? For you know, for these you know, for some of this esoteric finance stuff from the IMF, why the heck are we doing that, and why is some of this coming out of the 150 account? So, what's your answer to legitimate, perhaps concerns either out of the 150 account, which is the foreign aid or the foreign operations account, as well as from the 50 account, which is the 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 military, the hard side of of our of our the kinetic side, if you will, of our of our international relations. What's, how do you answer those concerns for House members? Why, why should they be willing to take a hit? And how would you answer uh, Congressman McKeon? Um, well, there had to be a pay for. I mean, given that um, it, it was scored as it was at 315 million, um, I think there was a clear view on both on the Hill and in the administration that they had to find a way to pay for it. I think what they did is a pretty responsible exercise of figuring out where their resources available. Um, I say that as someone who um, spent my time in the Treasury Department worrying about um, the very programs that, that may, may be paying for uh, the, the, the fund uh, commitment. Um, but, you know, I think the administration did what it could working with counterparts on the Hill um, to find areas where that cost could be borne without, um, without real damage or, or pain. Okay, so three hundred million dollars out of say thirty billion for the the one five zero account, and out of whatever it is, eight hundred billion for the yeah. I mean, in the scheme, this, these is, this is small, peanuts. These, this are, is these are small dollars. I mean, no, in in one sense, no dollar is small. It's it's always hard in a in an in an environment of of tight budgets as we are in now. Um, but on the other hand, as you say, in the larger scheme of things. Um, it's it's not that hard to, to make this fit. Okay, so eat your vegetables, in other words. Okay. So either talk about this veto issue, alternate forms, talk about also, if you would, or, or any of those, as well as the issue of, okay, we're going we're gonna to encounter a lot of resistance on the House side, especially from folks like on the Armed Services Committee or even folks who, you know, this is going to be taken out of the, the foreign assistance, uh, perhaps, the 150 account as well. How, how do you answer that question? Well, I, as George Bush, I hate, color, I hate broccoli. Um, it is a tough sell. Um, I would do a long, in my mind as a pseudo-academic, I would take the long view and say, let's look at how OMB scores and let's get it back. But it is... Um, 315 million spread over many billions, and it can be a day's accounting error in some institutions. So 
I am not going to sweat that amount of money in the U.S. budget, frankly. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, it seems relatively small given the size of the military, the 50 plus the 150 accounts. Um, these, it is something also where if it does look like a hard vote because of the amount of money, then the IMF has a role in global financial stability and promoting growth. They're doing some very recent and excellent research on promoting growth, um, which not all of you may agree with here, but um, on redistribution, growth, and equality. And they're looking for creative ways to support growth. They're also doing research with the OECD and the G20 on tax policies to promote better tax collection within developing countries. So um, they are genuinely constructive. So they fit within the 150 account and they will reduce some of the instability that can lead to military crises. Also by making um, China and hopefully Russia a little bit feel more comfortable uh, working through the IMF than on their own, that too is a global security issue that is that benefits from this money. Um, on your opt-outs, um, I would just say that it's very curious that the Chiang Mai Initiative, which is an um, East Asia, Southeast Asian uh, agreement to support each other in financial crises and not have to go to the IMF, the first thing they do is have to get an assessment and the IMF has to agree to their reform policy. So even this most sophisticated of the regional opt-outs depends on the IMF. Um, so it's that, the bilaterals, yes, they're secret and you want, you'd worry in a different, on a different level. But the, the sophisticated Chiang Mai initiative is wedded to the IMF. So are we gonna lose our veto? Absolutely not. Clay. Um, <clears throat> the chairs and chairs issue you covered basically correctly. Um, so I'm not gonna talk much about that. Um, I wanted to actually just address a couple. Of, I, first of all, I actually agree with a lot of what Desmond's analysis is. Um, I come to a different conclusion, obviously, but I, I, but I agree with a lot of his analysis. Uh, one factual clarification is the 2009 agreement, which basically boosted the resources of the IMF, was not because of the Western European crisis. It was actually a lot because the global system was in trouble. Um, and if you, if you actually go and look at 2008, you will see in the month of November of 2008, which is right in the middle of the U.S. financial crisis, that there were lending programs that the IMF was doing to Georgia, Latvia, Ukraine, Iceland, Romania, Hungary, and maybe Bulgaria, though I can't remember all Bulgaria. I believe actually there was more money put out during the month of that, uh, either that October or November than was done in the Asian financial crisis, and no one actually remembers that. Um, and, and that was because uh, there was a global financial crisis that was hitting lots of different countries. We obviously were very focused on the United States for very obvious reasons, which means that having something like the IMF actually was very helpful uh, with a lot of those countries. Did those programs work in every case? No. Ukraine is a very good example of where it did not. Latvia, by the way, is a case where it did. Um, the issue you raised, Dan, about uh, are there legitimate concerns about the IMF? Absolutely. And, and some of them, uh, my former boss, John Taylor, raised in an op-ed recently saying, one, that he was not in favor of this quota increase at this point in time because of one of the points that uh, Desmond raised, which is about the exceptional access program seems to be ignored, which basically means that you can get any amount of money you want. And secondly, because he was concerned that the IMF was resurrecting the uh, sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, which is kind of a, a very fancy way of saying a global bankruptcy procedure. Um, uh, my view on that is that's where Congress should be working with the administration. And they should be putting conditions down. And they should say, the United States should basically be working with the IMF on using its voice and vote to prevent any type of recreation of the SDRM, if that's something that Congress and the administration believe is the right thing to do. They should basically say, let's have a report 
uh, every year, plus try to put more teeth into the exceptional access type of program. By the way, we may be providing exceptional access to Ukraine. Is that the type of exception we want? Maybe it is. But then let's report on it. Let's be very transparent about how we're doing it. Because um, uh, I agree, like, we sh the problem of doing exceptional access programs all the time is one, obviously it makes a joke of the word exceptional, and two, um, it does potentially lead towards a moral hazard problem. Desmond raised a very good point about private sector involvement. How do you do that? It's going to be difficult um, because uh, you're always trying to struggle with the idea of how do you catalyze more private investment to come in while at the same time uh, whacking that same private investment. Um, so that is something that has to be addressed and I think the IMF will have to address that when they start working with the Ukrainians, which they're obviously already doing, as, as Scott mentioned, on day one of the interim government. Um, in terms of cutting a deal, that's what Washington is about. <laughs> Cut a deal. I mean, I don't know what the damn deal is. Um, I know that there's a bunch of House Republicans who want something done on 501c4, which is an IRS issue. They actually seem like they have a point to me. Um, cut a deal on that. If if it is something on a Keystone pipeline, cut a darn deal on that. Um, is it is it basically should we be exporting natural gas, and actually having a real approach that is comprehensive towards Ukraine? That is, there's sanctions involved. There's a one billion dollar guarantee. There's IMF reform, which I agree with Desmond is not necessary for Ukraine, though I do believe that it is necessary for the United States not to look like we're leaderless on these issues. Um, and maybe there should be export, uh, there should be a, a relaxment of, of exports of energy. I don't know. Yeah. I was thinking it is a town. I was thinking bring back robust missile defense in Eastern Europe might be a good trade too. Maybe it is. I don't know. It is a town where deals are made all the time. And uh, the administration, was it somewhat cynical to put IMF reform onto this bill? Maybe. Uh, but then again, they tried to put it onto the omnibus bill. They tried to put it on in a, as a separate bill. Um, you find vehicles. That's what you do. I promise you, if Russia had never f invaded Ukraine, the administration would have used whatever the next bill was that was going through Congress, probably the doc fix bill, talk about no relationship, um, to do something on IMF reform because they think it's an important thing. I happen to agree with the administration on that issue. And I actually think that there are uh, a variety of Republicans who agree. I just saw a letter that came out from the Bretton Woods Committee. That letter did not necessarily, it had a bunch of secretaries of treasury, Republicans and Democrats, a bunch of US trade representatives, Republicans and Democrats. Okay, they're a bunch of economic weenies. What do they care about them? It also had, by the way, some of the people that were in charge of the, of the Defense Department under Ronald Reagan in terms of rollback of the Soviet Union. They had people who were in charge of basically invading Iraq and in Afghanistan after 9-11. These are national security hawks, as well as, by the way, people from the Democratic Party that are very important people on, on military and, and, and diplomacy. So I just think that there's, you know, there's a lot of people who support the IMF because they've seen it in government that it is an important tool for the United States of America. Okay, Desmond. Yeah, just can we take up, uh, Two of the points, you know, the first one on what is the United States giving up by going into this deal, I think that they would be giving up a lot. As it's already been stated, uh, the United States does not have a veto over the lending decisions of the IMF out of the general resources. So to be transferring money out of the NAB to a permanent general resource fund of the IMF the United States potentially loses a veto power over how some of the money could be uh, distributed. Uh, the second point is countries looking for uh, alternatives. I don't think that if you get IMF reform through, if you give all of these countries however much representation they have on the board, that is going to stop countries from wanting to look for alternate sources of funds. The real problem with IMF lending is the conditionality that is imposed and the results that one gets. So it's no accident that in the 1998 Asian crisis with those countries experiencing severe hardship with the IMF intruding into all highly charged political issues that the IMF 
is extremely unpopular there. The same thing is going on in Europe right now. You can be sure that once Greece is out of uh, its difficulties, as one day it eventually will, there'll be no way politically that the Greeks can come back and seek the IMF in much the same way as the Argentines uh, can't do it. So I don't think that it's uh, uh, the fact that the IMF isn't reformed and it isn't representative. The issue is the IMF imposes harsh conditionality. There might be good reasons for the IMF uh, to do it. You don't want to just throw money down a rat hole, but so long as there are softer sources of funds, people will go uh, and seek those. Uh, Stan Fisher, I think, uh, who used to be Deputy Managing Director of the IMF, uh, put it uh, rather well when he was at the IMF. He said, countries come to the IMF with the same enthusias enthusiasm as patients go and see their oncologist. Uh, you know, and I think that uh, that uh, is the sad truth. Okay, I've got time for a couple questions. Uh, my friend Aaron here, and then uh, let's see. I want to be diverse in terms of geographically in the audience here, and so this gentleman in the last row. So Aaron and this gentleman here. So Aaron, here's the microphone. Thank you, Dan. Um, there was some talk just, about just just introduce yourself. Aaron Rank with the House Financial Services Committee. There was some talk about the cost being about $300 million, but the uh, CBO score for the Senate bill showed that the rescission would be about $1.2 billion. Can you talk about the difference there? Um, my understanding is that in 2009, the CBO recommended it be scored on uh, fair market value principles uh, adjusting for market risk, that both Democratic chairs of the House and Senate Budget Committees agreed with that. The ranking members, the Republican ranking members agreed, and that OMB signed off as well. So why, why is the administration now trying to change that and do it under present value scoring, which yields a much lower score? Okay, and we'll get this gentleman over here. Ian Talley, Wall Street Journal. Um, <coughs> uh, firstly, do you think that uh, there are 40 votes that can join the 180 Democrats uh, in the House. Secondly, is it diversity of, of, of options always a good thing, especially in the global financial uh, architecture and so having the Chiang Mai initiative, having the, the e ESM, uh, the, and there's a Latin America, there's a CRA that the, uh, the BRICS are trying to put together. And finally, um, is it not possible to, since there's a consensus, on uh, reforming, uh, giving emerging markets larger shares. Uh, is there not uh, the potential to change the, uh, reform the quotas, but not double them? Okay. Uh, reform the quotas, but not double them. Okay. I'm gonna call in my friend, Bill Frenzel, for a minute and just put, you may wanna just think about this for a minute, about this issue about the 40 votes. I'll ask you to think about that and we'll come back to you, but I wanna put you, just flag that for you. Um, I wanna, I think this question that Aaron puts about the budget issue I actually think is very, very important. There's, there's been some accounting issues. Um, there's been some accounting issues having to do with whether it was a supplemental or whether it was under a, a normal budget situation and then how those costs have been distributed, I think actually I think are one of the critical points of, of actually getting this done. So can I, let me ask, can I ask Scott and Clay to take that one? So Scott, why don't, Clay, why don't you start first and then I'll have Scott go second. Um, look, I, <laughs> here's, here's my answer on um, scoring questions. I, look, I think you can go down a rabbit hole on these issues. Um, to me, it's important to recognize underlying principles. And as I said at the outset, I, I actually dispute um, where the record stands on, on um, existing scoring. I, I actually think the precedent was politically imposed. It, I don't think it was um, driven by technocrats in, in the earlier decision. Um, but the, the underlying principle that is worth remembering is that the, you know, the U.S. financing relationship with the fund is an exchange of assets. Um, there's been nothing historically to demonstrate um, an underlying risk in that relationship, and um, it's a political outcome that we we have to cough up 315 million and then find uh, pay for us. But I think that is a settled issue. Um, 
Um, that's you know that's that's my judgment on that. Hey, Clay, on on that question, on the on on what the cost of this is. Uh, yeah. So um, look, uh, first of all, it's a little difficult to figure out exactly what the CBO has done because they haven't really been very transparent about a lot of the numbers. Which I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. I don't know a lot about CBO's uh, practices. Um, I will say I, this. I've heard some things where they call folks from the outside and say, well, how much do you think it costs? So yeah, it's a very difficult calculation to make, so I have a lot of, and I have a lot of respect for the CBO. I think what you've seen is if you look at every single quota increase in the past, the scoring was zero. If you look at the one in 20, 2009, it was $5 billion. Um, and I think what they've done here is they've tried to figure out, I mean, if you asked the Treasury Department, they would not agree to $315 million. They would say it's zero. If you asked OMB, I think they would come up with some tiny little number, like $10 million or something like that. Um, and then it could be all the way up to $1.2 billion if you have some sort of a market risk type of calculation, but it's very difficult to figure out how do you have market risk. Uh, because the IMF has always been considered, um, including in some legal precedents, a preferred creditor. Um, I actually think the $315 million, I have zero idea if that's correct. I think what you have is that the CBO came up with a score. It is obviously uh, part of that scoring is going to be lowered in some respect because really what you're doing is transferring it from one pot of money to another pot of money, which is maybe a slightly more risky pot. So I could see basically scoring that. And I could see that obviously there's, there's uh, scores based on one was an emergency funding appropriation and, and one is not. Um, but in the end, the CBO, I mean, I get the feeling the CBO basically said, this is what we got. And so, you know, look, we deal with the CBO. Sometimes Republicans hate what the CBO does. Sometimes Democrats hate what the CBO does. But right now, this appears to be the scoring that we have. Desmond, if you want to comment on that, I wanted you and Joe Marie to talk about this issue of diversity of alternates to the IMF and this issue of can you, this, this third party up to the question from the gentleman from the Wall Street Journal about can you change around this, this issue of quotas and, and votes. If, I was hoping you were going to comment on those, but if you want to comment briefly on this issue of the cost, that's fine, but I was hoping both of you would take those two questions. Yes, sir, if you would, sir. Just the first point I wanted to make, you know, just in terms of potential cost to the United States taxpayer is the U.S. Treasury runs the argument the whole time that relax there's no way that the taxpayer is going to be on the hook because the IMF has got preferred status. The IMF has never lost money before. I would say that that is really not that relevant to what is going on now because the IMF has never loaned on the scale to an individual country that it has before. So if you look, for instance, at the amount of money that the IMF has loaned to Greece, you're talking about the IMF having exposure of something like 30% of Greece's annual tax revenues. So to think that the IMF might not lose money on that deal, uh, I think one's really got to be optimistic. So what I'm saying is that the past precedent, you know, which makes you feel very comfortable, the IMF's never going to lose money, goes out of the window when the IMF is just lending as much money uh, as it feels it needs to at that time and uh, creates ready uh, great exposure. Uh, just on the question of diversity, uh, you know, clearly that uh, is uh, important. You know, in the European context, uh, it wasn't clear, you know, and at the IMF board, there's a lot of concern. You know, many people from the emerging markets are referring to the International Monetary Fund now as the European Monetary Fund, you know, because all that the IMF does is loan to European countries. It's not clear, you know, what is the interest of uh, the uh, international community in supporting uh, Europe to the extent that it, it did, that this should have been done by the Europeans. The putting in place of the European Stability Mechanism uh, is actually, uh, I would say, uh, uh, that is an appropriate uh, step that the Europeans should be doing more of the heavy lifting for Europe than expecting the United States or the rest of the world. You know, when we run into problems in uh, Texas or in California, you know, we don't go and ask the European Central Bank to be lending us money to bail them out. Uh, just the last point, I, I think that that really goes to the heart of what I was trying to say is that while uh, one 
really does want to have reform of the uh, uh, the IMF board, the governance, the whole voting structure, give more representation to the countries uh, that have got power. Conceptually, you can do it in two ways. You know, once you can increase the quotas, give more to the ones who are underrepresented and less, or alternatively, you can reduce the size and, you know, have the ones that uh, um, are overrepresented be the ones that really reduce the quotas. But presumably, politically, one's advanced so far in the stage that the two are very closely linked. And if you did go the way that you should go, you know, begin from start, let's ask ourselves, with everything that's gone into in Europe, do we really need the IMF of this size? You know, because now they've got the wherewithal to take care of any of their problems. Why do you need the International Monetary Fund to do it? And I would say that the case for the International Monetary Fund is rather weak considering how they messed up in the European crisis. They didn't see the crisis coming. They misdiagnosed the crisis you know, by their own admission. Europe is in uh, any country where the IMF has been involved is in a state of total collapse that they haven't seen since the 1930s. You know, I don't think that that is uh, a ringing endorsement you know, for having a lot of mo more money to throw around at these countries. Hey, Joe Marie, I'm going to for the panel, I'm going to give you the last word, and then I'm going to give 30 seconds to uh, Congressman Frenzel to comment on this issue of, are we going to get 40 votes in the House on the Republican side? So, Joe Marie. Okay. Thank you again. And um, it's amazing how much I think like Desmond, uh, again, coming to somewhat different conclusions. On the, um, on the diversity of altern alternate sources of funding, I think that's just human nature. You always go to the person who will give you the, the fewest conditions, and if that works out, great. I think issues of secrecy are a problem, both domestically and the, the borrowing countries, I think can be a, a serious problem um, in that way. And how do you hold a single donor accountable if they put, impose unreasonable conditions or want a military base or some other condition that is totally unacceptable? I think that's probably the reality we live with right now, especially when there are several countries that have very large surpluses, especially China. Um, Germany has a large surplus, as does Japan, but they don't seem to be doing the international outreach as much. Um, in terms of uh, disaggregating the reform package, I think it's all but impossible that you've had uh, uh, legislative bodies around the world already take action on it. The United Nin States... 19 of the G20 have approved this, this exactly. arrangement. And the United States led the combined package, and now for us to say, wait, 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 we have to take it apart, it's just politically not feasible. Um, in regard to the conditions that go with IMF funding, that has been my theme song for a generation. I started on this when I was pregnant with my 24-year-old, so um, I, I know about that, um, and I agree with Desmond very much. The, the fa what I have been told is that if you have more assets, you don't have to be as, as strict in the conditions. Uh, it hasn't been tested to my knowledge, but uh, that's why I fight for increased assets for the IMF, to make them less severe in their conditions. Also, there is some learning going on at the IMF. Uh, they have been just focused on country by country macroeconomic policies. They're starting to look at spillovers. So with that, I will stop and be polite. Okay, Congressman Frenzel, last word. Here's a microphone for you. Uh, I thank you. A uh, question about uh, getting votes and uh, getting 40 Republican votes in the House. On the three key votes that I mentioned before, uh, the 40 roughly Republicans were always headed by the speaker, the majority leader, and sort of their inside pals, and what you might call a governance caucus of the House Republicans. There's, of course, the Tea Party caucus at one end and a governance caucus at the other end. There's enough votes in that caucus uh, to provide uh, with the Democrats a majority, but until uh, Speaker Boehner and his principal assistants are convinced that there is a link between uh, 
uh, IMF uh, quota reform and the assistance bill, I think it will be very difficult. And with that, thank you all. And please join me in thanking the panel.